It's like a tinderbox, it's just waiting for the spark. It's gonna happen at some stage, there's gonna be a fire. No one must condone the violence, no one must condone the disgraceful events that took place. It should not have happened. They were criminal, criminal, and they should never have occurred. Riots are the voice of the oppressed, and these were the voice of the oppressed. After the waves of immigrants in the 50s and 60s, there were, by the early 80s, well-established black and Asian communities in Britain. This is the story of a struggle, at first by violent protest, then by political and legal means, against what they perceive to be their second-class status in British society. In April 1981, rioting erupted suddenly in Brixton. The rioters were mainly black youths, many with a deep sense of grievance. Their target was a predominantly white police force. It was intimidating. It was frightening. Um, you didn't know what was going to happen next. I was very, very surprised at the ferocity of the riots. Um, I didn't believe that that sort of thing would happen in my country. On one day of rioting alone, at least 45 members of the public and nearly 300 policemen were injured. The last thing I wanted was, uh, after it was over, to find a police officer hanging from one of the lampposts. The Brixton riots were not the first inner city disorders, but they were the first to get a political response. The Home Secretary, William Whitelaw, immediately summoned the Metropolitan Police Chiefs. And Commissioner Lee across the table said, he said, he said the Home Secretary would like to come to visit Brixton. Mr Whitelaw said, I'll come about five o'clock. And uh, the Commissioner said, yes, OK. And I, I just quickly whistled the Commissioner's ear, no, please, the rioting might start at five. So he said, well, we might start a fire, so Mr White said, well, I'd better come at three then. Whitelaw was accompanied by Timothy Raisin, the minister responsible for race relations. What you got was a very strong sense of enormous tension. You get a smouldering sort of aftermath of it. Obviously, the police were on very high alert. I have seen enough damage to convince me that a serious breakdown of law and order occurred. I've also seen enough to convince me that the police have, in their very difficult task, and I want to say this again, again, and again, deserve the support of every law-abiding citizen in this country. One of the interesting things about all this episode is that it was, in fact, the Home Secretary who made the running. The basis of the Thatcher government at that period was that Margaret Thatcher would pursue things to do with the economy and so on, but that there was a kind of tacit, or maybe not even tacit, deal between Margaret and Willie um, by which she, in effect, agreed not to interfere with his department. I and mean, that was absolutely crucial. The events of this weekend called for the most thorough examination. I have therefore decided to appoint an inquiry under Section 32 of the Police Act 1964. I have invited Lord Scarman to undertake this inquiry, and I am glad to say he has accepted. He had a reputation, both as a highly intelligent man, a very distinguished judge and all that, and also for being an independent-minded person. Very important, if you had that inquiry, not to have somebody who could be accused of being a stooge. But Scarman's appointment came at a time of high unemployment, Black youths were particularly hard hit. 
Because the opposition blamed the job losses on Thatcher's economic reforms, Scarman and his team would have to tread warily. I think we all knew that the remit would have to embrace social and economic issues. Um, but we also knew that to say that up front would be to frighten some of the horses, uh, to upset some people in government who might see this as, you know, a um, uh, far more dangerous kind of operation than uh, they thought it was supposed to be. Only three months later, a weekend of rioting in Toxteth highlighted the fact that the government was facing a problem on a national scale. At one point, with casualties mounting, the police almost lost control. They were given permission to use CS gas, the first time it had been used on mainland Britain. The explosion of violence hadn't been predicted, hadn't been expected, which came with quite extraordinary ferocity. It shook, certainly, the political system in, in, in Whitehall and Westminster. Indeed, the Prime Minister determined to see Toxeth for herself and to talk to members of the local community at Liverpool City Hall. I can see her now. I was sat facing Mrs. Thatcher, I'm sat facing you. I, I was in the middle of our team and she was in the middle of her team, so I was sat facing like that. And she was leaning forward and she was saying, nothing can justify this behaviour, nothing can justify this violence. Um, we cannot have this, 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 this situation. It was, it was that, that, that kind of a tone. She never felt that uh, unemployment was a very convincing uh, reason for um, uh, trouble of that kind, bearing in mind that far higher degrees of unemployment had been born earlier in this nation. Um, but social problems, yes. And among the social problems were, of course, a breakdown in respect for authority, a breakdown in family life, a breakdown in respect for elders, and a lack of pride in the area. She really did listen, and I have to give a tribute to that, for that, she did listen. But you know, I think what she heard was so much outside of her experience that I feel she would be unable to interpret what was being said and act on that. But Margaret Thatcher did act when she returned to London by sending a special task force to Liverpool, headed by the Environment Secretary, Michael Heseltine. David Edmonds, one of his top civil servants, was with him. It was the days, of course, before spin doctors, um, but I knew Liverpool a bit, so I said, for the next, uh, the next part of the trip, let's, let's walk down to the, the harbour. So we did, followed by the press, and then let's get on the Mersey Ferry, and we did. Okay. Purely by accident, there was a black girl sitting on the top deck of the ferry whom Michael Heseltine sat and chatted to. Have you got any family here? Yes, yes. 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 Have they got jobs? Yeah, good job. 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 Good job politician of depth. But by Jove, I think she was impressed by his presentational and his political abilities on Merseyside. When we first went to the area of the riots, there was a lot of destruction. There were still smouldering timbers. There were people who came to talk to us who had bruises, cuts, who had clearly been involved in it. Memorable occasion when Heseltine met black youths who had clearly been involved in, 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 in the rioting. They said that they were discriminated against in terms of jobs and employment. They were discriminated against in terms of housing and, and they were discriminated against by the police. 
Michael Heseltine allowed himself to, um, to observe the situation. He allowed himself to, to look at what was taking place. What do you make of all this? Well, that's not good news, is it? I understand that that's five years that's been like that. I think he was visibly shocked, which contrasts with, with the view of Margaret Thatcher. That there's no deprivation here. In London, Scarman was busy conducting his own inquiry into the causes of the Brixton riots. His official terms of reference meant that his main focus had to be on police behaviour and relations with the black community. One of the prime causes of discontent was saturation policing and the use of the notorious sus law to stop anyone thought to be acting suspiciously. Much of the criticism was levelled at young police officers. The majority are, 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 are they're, 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 they're youths, man, they're kids. They're not qualified police officers who can talk to people. They don't know how to talk to people. They're 18, 19, look like 18, 19, just cut out cadet school. And they're going on down. Come here and make a show, show the power. Big fucking people with right. big blokes like them. That's right. Must have respect, man. Of course. They don't, don't show, show us no respect. respect. Show respect we don't, they don't show us no respect. How the hell are we going to show them any respect? My recollection is that the percentage of street robberies um, committed by uh, black youths and men was something in the region of 80 to 90 percent and the victims were mainly white as they say they're doing their job yeah but at the same time i mean you have to compromise in a sense in the sense where you can't harass people every day day in day out because this in is black you know? are they really doing that are they really harassing people every day day in day out everybody will back me up everybody will back me up the anger on the street spilled over into the inquiry itself. All these people at the back in the audience who were shouting at, at us, and uh, it was quite intimidating. I had the impression that we were on trial, that we were the defendants, and uh, that uh, the rioters were the defendants, we were the defendants in this particular case. Halfway through his inquiry, Scarman had an opportunity to see for himself what was alleged to be an example of insensitive policing. Officers had wreaked havoc whilst raiding 11 houses in Brixton in a fruitless search for bomb-making equipment. Scarman decided to visit the site of the houses which had been raided. And as we approached, we had to pass through a police cordon because the police were standing back at a distance expecting um, that there could well be trouble. We approached on foot and there was a very large crowd, a couple of hundred or, or more, with the lone figure of the local community, Bobby P.C. Brown, uh, standing in the midst of them. And as we approached, uh, a sort of chant went up, Skarman, Skarman, Skarman and we were swept on a wave into these houses um, and taken round. What you had was a well-meaning liberal judge doing uh, his, his level best, uh, but you sometimes felt, watching him at work, that it was a bit like sort of the district commissioner uh, out on trek. Uh, and I've got some experience of district commissioners, and there were some very good ones, but they were never going to be the ag agents of radical change. But at the time of its publication, the Scarman report marked a watershed by drawing attention to the depth and extent of racial discrimination. A new generation of black Britons who'd grown up here felt deeply alienated. It's available only at eight pounds. <laughs> Deprived youngsters who believed that they were deprived because of the colours of their skin, unable to get what they thought were fair opportunities of education or jobs, and suffering, as they thought, harassment, took to the streets because they saw no other way of airing their grievances. Scarman proposed reforms to improve police relations with the black community and to weed out individual officers whose behaviour was racist. Nothing 
nothing to say. He also identified more general racist attitudes among the police. Scarman did say that one had to look at the informal culture of the police and of other institutions, the canteen culture, for example, um, which is a powerful um, influence on the way people behave in practice. Scarman made clear that good policing would be of no avail unless it was accompanied by measures to improve jobs, education and housing. But politically, he was realistic. I'm conscious that I'm a judge. I'm not responsible for the finances or the economy of the country. All I can do is to analyze the social conditions, indicate areas where improvements uh, could be made and ought to be made, and then leave it to the politicians in Parliament to decide whether the money is to be made available. I hope the money will be made available. On his return from Liverpool, Heseltine had written a minute for his cabinet colleagues. It took a riot. The title, at least, was provocative. The report that Heseltine put to Mrs Thatcher was not a Thatcherite document, but it was very carefully couched. It made very clear that violence as a means of securing economic or political ends couldn't be countenanced. And it trod a very delicate line between saying we have to do something and we have to respond to violence. But at the end of the day, that underlying message was it took a riot to make us consider what best to do. <laughs> Later in 81, Heseltine had to go to the Conservative Party conference. I'm delighted to introduce the Secretary of State, the Right Honourable Michael Heseltine. He was extremely concerned about the speech that he had to make there. I vividly remember sitting next to his office for several days while he wrote sheaf after sheaf of paper in his totally unintelligible manuscript, trying to get the tone right. What he wanted was a tone that conveyed the real concern, that actually said that we needed to change. Self-help has a limited meaning in an inner city community where 40% of the young kids may be without work and if you're black it may be 60%. I know those problems. I grew up in the 30s with an unemployed father. He didn't riot. He got on his bike and looked for work and he kept looking till he found it. In our inner cities are just a signpost of a journey of despair. And there will be no recovery without more resources. I am not willing to throw away the prospects of lasting recovery in an orgy of self-indulgence, false sentimentality and self-justification. And no one in this government is. Tebbit was speaking for the government. Thatcher held firm to her economic reforms. This meant that the solutions advocated by both Heseltine and Scarman were not taken up wholeheartedly. I think it would be a mistake to think that money can solve the problems. Money can't buy either trust or racial harmony. The Thatcher government did very little in actually putting in real jobs, improving the housing, improving the, the, the quality of life for black people in Toxteth. As far as policing in London was concerned, some of Scarman's recommendations were accepted. There has been some change, certainly in the rhetoric of senior police officers, and indeed in terms of institutional change, the development of liaison committees. But in terms of what actually happens on the street, the impact of policing, particularly on the black community, remains completely unaltered. The same abuses occur, the same tensions exist, and indeed there's a growing alienation and bitterness. The Tottenham riot tonight, police say a revolver as well as a shotgun was used. London's top policeman has given notice that his men are ready to use plastic bullets and tear gas. The warning came after last night's frenzy of violence on a housing estate in North London, during which a policeman was hacked to death. 
The murder of PC Keith Blakelock, the only policeman to die during these inner city disorders, remains unsolved. The horror of the violence and the fact that there were other disturbances that year led some people to fear that rioting was becoming a feature of British life. What happened after 1985 uh, was uh, a growing sense uh, on the part uh, of the police and the public that the end of the road had been had been reached that unless uh, there was some modus vivendi some accommodation reached as between police and public in those areas then the outcome would be one that was absolutely catastrophic Black people in the process of taking care of business. While the inner cities were simmering, some black and Asian activists felt the way to get a fair deal was by engaging in politics, mainly labor politics. It's not used as fathers in this society. So that when black people... But frustrated by their own lack of progress within the party, they started a campaign for separate black sections. The labor leadership was opposed. Black sections categorize, classify, and separate men and women according to their race and according to their color. We've been accused of apartheid, right? I'll tell you what's apartheid. All white parties and multiracial constituencies, that's apartheid. And all white House of Commons, that's apartheid. We are providing... If they'd been cleverer and if they tried to talk to us and, and get into dialogue, the campaign might have dissipated much earlier, but because we met this quite extraordinary resistance, um, that actually strengthened the campaign, because it was just illogical. This was a party which had women's sections, youth sections, Welsh sections, and they were balking at a black section. Uh, it wasn't easy to talk to the proponents of black sections, but it was easy to notice the sort of people they were. They were professional, metropolitan, ambitious, potential members of parliament. They were the leaders, not the led. And in my view, we didn't speak for the rank and file black and Asian Labour Party member as much as those of us who thought they ought to be integrated into the Labour Party did. Paul Boateng was chosen from an all-black shortlist to contest the constituency with the highest concentration of ethnic minorities in Europe. And I do hereby declare that the said Paul Boateng is duly elected to serve as Member of Parliament for the Church We were fighting at that time a global battle for enfranchisement, for empowerment and enablement of black people so that people, wherever they were, were, re were regarded and judged not by the colour of their skin but by the content of their character. That applied in Brent, it applied in Soweto, I said so. And I say this, Brent South today Soweto tomorrow. Thank you very much, brothers and sisters. Boateng was not the only black candidate to be successful in the 1987 general election. It's a bit like starting a new school. You've got to find your desk, you've got to find a peg, um, you've got to find out where the cloak rooms are, and you think, gosh, will I ever make any friends? Good morning. My name's Diane Allison. I'm a new member. Yes, I know. If you'd like to go through the swing doors, I'll look after you for this. Thank you very much. My mother was still alive and she came to the house to hear my maiden speech. And you know, I, a lot of older black people in particular were very touching about it because they've said to me, you know, when we see you on the television we feel... Do you know what I mean? They felt that the years of doing the menial jobs and the years of taking all sorts of slights were somehow vindicated. So you felt you'd done it for them. You think, I felt in a way I'd done it for that post-war generation. Altogether, one Asian and three black Labour MPs were elected that year. A first step towards healing the political alienation felt by the racial minorities. The crushing of the student democracy movement in Beijing had a profound effect in Hong Kong, which Britain was due to hand back to China in eight years' time. 
Watching the events unfold live on giant monitors, the Hong Kong Chinese began to think of escape. And the British government suddenly realized it faced the prospect of renewed mass immigration. Up till then, those residents of the colony with a form of British nationality had been told that there was no question of them being granted right of abode in Britain. Confidence was shattered, ordinary people's confidence about what they might be going to face after 1997 uh, was dramatically changed. Um, and the whole right of abode issue, which had been there before, um, uh, in intensified hugely in uh, its uh, effect at, at home in Britain. Uh, and it meant that the whole policy had to be looked at again. And the pressure for this rethink grew as Hong Kong Chinese, particularly key civil servants, top businessmen and professional people, began to leave for the West. The stability of Hong Kong was at risk. I think it would have been quite impossible if there was a flood of people out of Hong Kong for Britain to have washed her hands of the whole matter and said that it was somebody else's responsibility. They had a form of British nationality and that meant, just as it meant at the time of the exodus from uh, East Africa in the 60s and the beginning of the 70s, it meant that at the end of the day we had a larger responsibility than anybody else. But Waddington knew any mass immigration would have flown in the face of conservative election pledges. I was in Hong Kong within a month of Tiananmen Square, and I felt as though I was a lightning conductor for a huge amount of concern on the part of the people of Hong Kong. Indeed, Sir Geoffrey is himself having something of a difficult time putting over the British government's position. There is simply no way that a British government could grant to several million people the right to come and live in Britain. It dismays me that some have suggested that this is a matter of race. It's nothing of the sort. It's a practical problem on an enormous scale. speech is insulting the intelligence of Hong Kong Chinese. We protest and we walk out. They were quietly escorted from the room and the rest of the crowd looked rather embarrassed and we carried on. And I said when I got back to the House of Commons at the beginning of July that we would look at any approach to that that might help to reassure the people of Hong Kong but without giving any kind of commitment. Uh, the issue was how do you find uh, a way of keeping key pe giving key people enough confidence that they were safe to stay in uh, Hong Kong, that they would actually stay there through the changeover. And uh, the best way of giving them that confidence to stay there is enabling them to leave, giving them a right of abode somewhere else. The issue was thrashed out at a cabinet subcommittee meeting in December. Now my line was, that's all very well, but first of all we've got to decide on numbers. What is the total number of passports we're talking about? And it was all about, you know, thin ends of wedges and opening the floodgates. The Home Office was naturally anxious that nothing that we did would be taken by the public as a weakening in our determination to maintain firm but fair immigration control. A heated? Yeah, fairly. Yeah, fairly heated. Um, it was wonderful, actually. I mean, I, I came out on a real high um, because I'd won the argument, basically, and I'd kn I knew that, I, um, that if we hadn't been as committed to it, Douglas and I, and really wanted to and really um, put a lot of our own credibility behind it, we wouldn't have won the argument. And we did. Contribution to our society. Is it because some of them work successfully? A week later, Maud and his boss Douglas Heard, now representing a united government, had to convince their own backbenchers. The plan was to grant the right of abode to 225,000 Chinese. Could my right honourable friend say whether the pledge that we have given for the last four general elections that there would be no further large-scale immigration yeah, yeah. Yeah. still stands yeah, yeah. or not. Yeah. Yeah. This is the last main chapter 
in the story of this country's empire. I am rather keen, and I'm sure he is rather keen, that that last chapter should not end in a shabby way. I remember Norman Tebbit coming to me in my room in the House of Commons and telling me that it all got to be changed because if there wasn't I'd be defeated on the floor of the House of Commons and he would cause mayhem and all the rest of it and uh, I told him I begged to differ and off he went. The bill was passed but only two-thirds of the 225,000 Hong Kong Chinese who now had the right to move to Britain actually registered their option to do so. Immigration remained an issue in Britain as conflict and hardship across the world led to increased numbers of refugees and people seeking asylum. The numbers reaching the UK grew dramatically from 6,000 a year in the late 80s to 55,000 in the mid-90s. But ministers claimed that most applicants were abusing the existing asylum laws to bypass strict immigration controls. We have a real problem in this country. We are seen as a very attractive destination because of the ease with which people can gain access to jobs and to benefits. And while, for instance, the number of, of asylum seekers for the rest of Europe are falling, the number in this country are increasing. Only a tiny proportion of them are genuine refugees. Genuine political refugees are few. The trouble is our system almost invites people to claim asylum, to gain British benefits. That can't be right, and I'm going to stop it. Britain should be a safe haven, not a soft touch. Well, there was no doubt that immigration asylum in this country has become a euphemism for talking about race. And then any politician that talks about cracking down on bogus asylum seekers or bogus immigrants is perceived in the public imagination to be talking about black people. Legislation Labour has long worried about being seen as soft on race. This anxiety came to the fore with the announcement of a new Conservative bill. A bill will be introduced to streamline further the handling of asylum applications and to strengthen enforcement of immigration controls. The asylum bill, we all know why it is there. The former Tory research director, who's now a Conservative candidate, said this when he left, immigration, an issue which we raised successfully in 1992 yeah, yeah. and again in the 1994 Euro elections campaign, played particularly well in the tabloids and has more potential to hurt. There is one party in this house using the race card, but it isn't mine. They sit on the benches opposite. Now, the Prime Minister denies that this issue is being used to play the race card in any sense. Let the new bill, let the new bill go to a standing committee of the House so that evidence can be taken and considered and let it be a genuine consensual exercise in getting at the truth. Well, that's um, a standard procedure really when you want to delay legislation and there was quite an urgent need for the legislation. So tactically they thought, oh well, Rising number of immigrants is bad news for Labour. We can play the, what amounts to the race card here. So the more there's controversy on this issue, the better it will be for us. There was absolutely nothing racist about that legislation. Um, and it was a monstrous and utterly false charge. I was very angry. Uh, well, I, you know, I was very cross. Mr Secretary Straw. Although it scrapped Howard's asylum law when it got into office, Labour did introduce a new and equally firm bill of its own. Unsatisfactory. What we have decided to do, I believe for very good reasons, is to take the uh, right to benefit, cash benefits, away for uh, asylum seekers away and to take them out of the social security system generally. Both parties, when in power, have pursued quite punitive regimes 
towards immigrants and asylum seekers. And as time has gone on, it has got worse. I mean, Hugh Gates would be shocked to imagine a Labour government will be putting forward immigration and nationality legislation of the character that we're currently putting forward. But that's how much things have deteriorated since the 60s. By introducing its own asylum bill, Labour has once again highlighted the cross-party view that strict immigration controls are in the interests of good race relations. There is a general consensus in this country that large-scale immigration would not be conducive to good race relations here and shouldn't be allowed. Now, uh, that is uh, certainly uh, a principle which my party holds. It's a principle which every other party, I think, claims to hold. So I don't think there's any, any difference there. I went to the house where I... Six years ago, Stephen Lawrence was buried in Jamaica. His death was to have far-reaching consequences for race relations in Britain. At the time, few people would have predicted that an apparently ordinary black couple could successfully challenge the police and the government. The Lawrence case tested the assumption by successive governments since the 60s that good race relations would follow firm immigration controls. What do we want? Justice! When do we want it? Now! What do we want? Justice! When do we want it? Now! What do we want? Neville and Doreen Lawrence were driven to campaign for justice by the failure of the police to find their son's killers. Their frustration led them to risk a private prosecution. It failed, and they were left wondering where they could turn next. I had always kept in close touch with the Lawrence case because one of their strongest supporters locally was also a family friend of mine. And when their private prosecution collapsed, she was talking to me, she was saying, well, really, we really don't know where to go from here. And I suggested that they should come and talk to Jack, who at that time was Shadow Home Secretary. Um, I told him about how I was feeling and what had happened around Stephen and the fact that, you know, we've been denied justice and we have not been told the truth of exactly what happened. And I believe the only way to get to the truth is to have an inquiry. Well, I listened to what they said. It was in some respects rather similar to many other meetings that I was holding before the election, um, which were on the basis of what if. Uh, and I said to them that I was very sympathetic to what they had to say, but naturally I couldn't say for certain what I would do if we won and if I were Home Secretary. But I would look at the matter very carefully. We decided, therefore, that we would write to Michael Howard, who was then Home Secretary. So I wrote to him and said that we'd had a meeting with Straw and how favourable uh, the idea of a public inquiry had been looked upon by Straw and could we have a public inquiry in this case to get to the truth of what happened? I, I was troubled by the case. It was being investigated by the Police Complaints Authority. I thought that the more sensible course to take would be to wait for the outcome of the Police Complaints Authority investigation before deciding whether a public inquiry was justified. Three months and a general election later, Straw, now Home Secretary, was in a position to influence events. He had all his entourage there, so just to make sure that whatever was said was recorded and nothing was said out of place, and I thought it was quite funny, really. Well, we were looking um, at what kind of inquiry was appropriate, and it's always easy with hindsight to, to say, well, this was the kind of inquiry that was appropriate. At first, it seemed as if um, they just wanted just to have uh, something similar to what Scarman had done in Brixton, and so it would be what we could do for the black community. And I told him that's not what I want, because I would never get to the truth that way. Jack, I know, because I spoke to him afterwards, was very impressed by Doreen, very impressed, and she changed his mind. He went into the meeting with her, the meeting after he became Home Secretary, 
with his mind more or less set against a legal inquiry and he came out willing to concede one. That I think is possibly Dorian's finest hour. Sir William Macpherson of Clooney was called out of retirement to preside over the inquiry. It opened on the 16th of March 1998, but within a matter of hours, it was adjourned. A newspaper article the previous day had implied that Macpherson's past record showed insensitivity on issues of race. Alarmed, the Lawrences went to see Straw. They demanded that he sack Macpherson. I've said, you know, we don't want him. We don't want that judge. He had the qualifications and he was available. Um, so that was why he was chosen. We looked at a, a number of possibilities. He seemed to be the most appropriate appointment and he was willing to do it, which was really rather important. The inquiry resumed under Macpherson, but the Lawrence team believed their intervention had strengthened their hand. In a sense, what we were saying to the world, to Sir William Macpherson and his advice was, look, we've put down our marker, we've set out our concerns, if uh, at the end of the day, a report comes out which doesn't um, look into the matters in the way that we hope, which is obvious in this case, then we've set our marker and we can then complain. If he means by that that the result of the week's adjournment and what happened during that week was that I leant over backwards um, in favour of the Lawrences and against the police, then I would resent that suggestion because I do not believe it was true, not one iota of truth in that. Although the inquiry was not about finding Stephen's killers, Macpherson believed that the five suspects should give some account of themselves. They were arrogant, and is that they, they can do whatever they like and they can get away with it because they've got away with it. And so they just didn't care. And watching them, and they had this, um, like a smirk on their face, and said, so like, you know, you can't touch us. The suspects supplied virtually no new information to the inquiry. But the real defendants at the inquiry were the Metropolitan Police. All aspects of their investigation were subjected to minute examination, beginning with the night of the murder. Critical was their handling at the scene of the crime of the prime witness, Stephen's friend, Dwayne Brooks. One of the senior officers present was Inspector Stephen Groves. When he arrived, he made the assumption, according to his evidence, that there had been a fight. Not that there had been a, a terrible murder in which young Duane Brooks had also been involved, but that there had been some kind of fight. And we believed that, um, in that sense, he stereotyped young Duane Brooks. What that did, in relation to Inspector Groves, was to effectively uh, close his mind to the possibility of going and searching for the real suspects, who Duane had said were... Uh, had headed down a particular road. Now, that to me shows that the racism, that the race stereotyping that uh, was in Inspector Groves mind played a significant part in the way the investigation was handled by the police on the night in question and thereafter. Did you see... Uh, no, I didn't see anything. Nothing at all? Definitely not, this time of the night. There was very little difficulty, I think I have to say, in establishing that things had gone wrong in the investigation. But um, the probing that um, took place uh, during the evidential phase was aimed at uh, the undercurrents and at um, motive or reasons behind the failures. And it was that which, of course, particularly the Lawrence legal team was aiming to establish. And we did detect, quite early on, in the evidence of um, some of the police officers, what we believed to be uh, institutional racism. Macpherson has said you've got to look at the totality of the way in which an institution works um, it, and see whether the effect, not the intention, but the effect of what it's doing is in some way discriminatory. And I think that has taken the definition further. Um, and um, is a much more, it's a difficult, it's a much more difficult concept to both to um, 
demonstrate and to grapple with, um, but grapple with it we clearly must. It was a moment that I never thought would ever happen. Madam Speaker, with permission I should like to make a statement about the report of the inquiry into the death of Stephen Lawrence. The fact that we as black people have managed to have caused such a change, it was quite something. There is no doubt that there were fundamental errors. The investigation was marred by a combination of professional incompetence, by institutional racism and by a failure of leadership by senior officers. And to be invited there to see it happen, that was quite something. The report says that institutional... This was the first and only time I have been aware of the whole house being aware of who was present in the public gallery. There was an enormous sense of occasion, of the importance of what we were doing. So I want this report to serve as a watershed in our attitudes to racism. I want it to act as a catalyst for permanent and irrevocable change, not just across our public services, but across the whole of our society. A key recommendation in McPherson's report is the extension of race relations legislation. Previous acts, all introduced by Labour Home Secretaries, have exempted law enforcement by the police. We simply felt that um, fairness and justice required everybody to be subject to the same law, and that therefore there was no reason in, in these days for the police to be excluded from the full rigours of the Race Relations Act. But it, I think it's very important, uh, and we're going to do it as quickly as possible. I mean, it won't just apply to the police service, by the way, it'll apply to all central public services, including the immigration service and the prison service. How quickly is quickly? Well, it's as soon as we can get legislation, but watch this space and watch the Queen's speech. Politicians have been saying for decades that strict immigration controls are necessary for good race relations. Over the last 20 years, many black and Asian Britons have made clear they think racial harmony requires further political action. It took a riot to give public recognition to racial disadvantage in Britain. Nearly two decades on, it took a murder inquiry for institutional racism to be placed centre stage. I believe that inquiry had opened the eyes of a lot of people, and for the first time, people who before who said, well, it's nothing to do with me, you know, you know um, I'm not racist. They begin to question themselves. Don't forget when we began this journey, there was a real question mark as to whether or not Britain was ever going to be uh, a multiracial, multicultural society. You still, in the old days, got the impression that some people felt, well, it was all a bad dream and one day they'd wake up and all the black folk would be gone. You know, repatriation was on the agenda. That's no longer the case. We are a multiracial society. The question now is the extent to which we make a success of it. Commissioner 